News, former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has died at 93 years old. O'Connor made history as the first woman to serve on the nation's highest court, paving the way for others to follow. Appointed by President Ronald Reagan in 1981, she would a decisive vote on a narrowly divided court for more than two decades, writing landmark opinions on abortion and affirmative action. Senior national correspondent Terry Moran joins me now with more on this. Terry, what do we know so far? Well, she's 93 years old, and she had been in, in very, very fragile health for years. This is uh, uh, several times over the past several years. There had been concern about her health. Uh, she did suffer from uh, Alzheimer's disease as well. But this is, this is the loss of an American icon, really, a woman who uh, bestrode the court in, in a surprising way. She was the center of the court for many, many years. And a woman on the court, she was the last person on the Supreme Court uh, who had been anything but a judge or a prosecutor. She was a politician. She had run for uh, the state Senate in Arizona and become the state Senate majority leader. And the reason I mention that is she had a practical knowledge of the issues that came before the court, of how governing worked outside the cloistered chambers of a judge. Uh, she understood the practical trade-offs, and that was the hallmark of her judging. She was pragmatic. She was the key vote in upholding uh, Roe versus Wade, which, of course, was overturned after she departed the court. She was the key vote in upholding affirmative action, which, of course, was overturned after she departed the court. In both instances, she didn't side with the liberals altogether, but she recognized uh, from her perspective that the law had to include those interests, that the Constitution had to recognize those interests while still giving voice and recognizing the interests on the other side. She was the consummate centrist, the consummate pragmatist on the court, uh, and an icon for women and girls and men and boys and everyone across the country, the way uh, that she took hold of this job as the first woman on the Supreme Court many decades ago. It's a major loss for the court and the country. Diane? <laughs> And Terry, looking back on the context here, take us back to 1981 and how pivotal that moment was to have the first woman on the Supreme Court. You know, I, I remember it, uh, actually. I, I was in college at the time Ronald Reagan had promised to put a woman on the court. It was his way of trying to soften his image. There was concerns that he would lose the, the women vote uh, in that election, and so he promised to put a woman on the court when the time came uh, and uh, she had the and he had the opportunity to fill a vacancy on the court. He looked around, and there was almost a unanimous agreement among uh, Republicans that he talked to in his administration and in the Congress that this woman, who was the chief justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had finished second in her class at the Stanford Law School, uh, first was the Justice William Rehnquist, who was also plugging for her appointment. Uh, Reagan brought her right on. He did uh, do an interview, had an interview with her, and they were fellow Westerners. They had that in common. She had this amazing upbringing on a 50,000-square-mile uh, ranch or something like that. Her nearest neighbor was uh, 100 miles away, uh, and that gave her a toughness. I interviewed her many times and, and spoke with her, and she was a a flinty interview. She, you, you had to really come prepared, as did every lawyer who appeared before her in court. Uh, tough, fair, brilliant, uh, and as I say, deeply pragmatic. Her understanding of the law was that it was not some mathematical equation or grand abstraction. It was something real in the life of the country, in the lives of the people in the country. And so when she came on the court, it was a huge moment. It was a huge moment. I, as I recall, uh, the Chief Justice of the United States at the time, Warren Burger, in that picture that they always have with the f new justices walking down the steps of the Supreme Court, felt that it would be gentlemanly of him uh, to hold her hand. She didn't like that much uh, and, and kind of let him know. Uh, she was immediately uh, a national figure in a way few Supreme Court justices ever are. And she understood that but hewed closely to her duties on the court, really only deploying her celebrity, as, it, as you might think it is, in, term, in good works and good causes. The last cause of her life before she uh, retired uh, from public life altogether was to try to improve—you see her there with a, a young boy—try to improve 
civic education in America. She felt Americans were losing grasp of how our country works, both in terms of the spirit of democracy and the spirit of the law and the actual pragmatic making of law, the, the making of our, perfecting of our union, uh, as the Constitution says. That was her, her passion in the end of her life because she despaired a little bit about the way the country was going, the way people understood how this democracy works. She was uh, one of a kind. Look, as they say, you did not want to uh, confront her without having done your homework, either in court or otherwise. But she was also uh, a, a delightful person. She was well known on the social circuit in Washington D.C. She and her and her beloved husband uh, were sort of main actors in social Washington. And so she was warm uh, off the court, on the court, and uh, she was all business. But uh, the loss, as they say, of an American icon, no question about it. So. Terry, there's so much to factor into this picture. What legacy does Justice O'Connor leave behind? That's a great question. I, I think you, you'll go back to her opinions and you'll see the way that she did try to combine what seems to be so much intention on the Supreme Court sometimes. A, a, a close reading of the Constitution. She was a conservative justice. She didn't think it was the judge's business to go inventing uh, new law or new rights. But at the same time, that those words had to mean something in our time. She did try to uh, reach that middle ground of honoring the intention of the founding of uh, framers of the Constitution and of the people who wrote the laws and passed them. At the same time, understanding that it was a judge's job to judge, to find out what was right uh, and true and decent in the case, never forgetting that individual plaintiffs are in this case. And that's why you saw her upholding Roe versus Wade several times. That's why you saw her uh, upholding affirmative action and other things. I was actually in the courtroom when uh, the court in uh, 1990. One, I believe it was, in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey case, upheld Roe versus Wade. She read her opinion from the bench, uh, declaring that the Constitution does embrace uh, a right of a woman to control that part of her body uh, that is pregnancy to the point of a viability, that the state then has an interest, balancing those interests in a way that, frankly, hit the middle ground and the sweet spot where most of the country is. Um, I think her legacy will be for future judges and justices to see how she did that, how she stayed true to her conservatism and, and true to the people who came into the court looking for justice. All right, our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Terry, thank you. And for more on the life and legacy of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, we have a full write-up on abcnews.com.